All right, so it's 9.30 for us in Central Europe. You can see my slide? Yes. And you can hear me, so um, great. It's in presenter view is the only thing. No, I think I put in full screen. Okay, I think what we can see is presenter view. Well, it's not a big deal. Anyway, okay. good morning <laughs> for, for uh, well, for, for us, maybe for you, some of you, it's uh, good evening or good afternoon. Uh, thank you for joining. So today we'll be having another uh, webinar of this uh, webinar series, the Knowledge Dissemination Dialogues. The title is The Canadian Experience Implementing Integrated AMR and AMU Surveillance in Food and Agriculture, a focus on dairy cattle. And our speaker today, we are always very thankful to our speakers. Today we need to be particularly thankful because Daniela is based um, in Canada. So for her, it's very early in the morning. Thank God she had a coffee. And uh, she's very thankful that she, she could uh, join us. Danielle is employed by the Public Health Agency of Canada. And she has a very, very, very impressed, uh, impressive CV that you can check online in the hyperlink that is put on the, the invitation to this uh, webinar, multiple degrees, very impressive PhD, master's, doctor of, doctor of veterinary medicine. And above all, she seems to us that it's a imp particularly impressive um, curriculum on surveillance. And so if you are into AMR and AMU, uh, and if, if, if you don't understand what AMR and AMU stands for, probably this might not be the right webinar for you. Uh, but uh, so let's, let's, in a minute, we'll pass it to Daniela to listen to her. We have a couple of uh, housekeeping uh, rules. Please do keep your microphone on mute. Uh, remain, rename yourself with your organization country followed by your name, if that's needed. The, pre the views presented today will be the ones of Daniela and not FAO. Please do not advertise your companies or any commercial products or brand. And at the end, post your questions in the chat. We'll aim to answer all the questions during the discussion at the end of the presentation. And we always ask our speakers to do the presentation about half an hour, and then we have about half an hour for the discussion. Keep in mind that the meeting is being recorded and the, the video and recording of the PowerPoint slides will be posted on the FAO YouTube channel and shared with today's participants. So, Danielle, I think the floor is all yours. I'll stop sharing, stop sharing so that you can share yours. And again, very thankful that you are there. Great. Uh, can you see my screen okay? I can. Perfect. I can. Um, yeah, so thank you so much for the lovely introduction. Um, and good morning, everyone, um, or good evening. <laughs> so as you've heard, um, I'm Daniela Rizzo. I'm a veterinary epidemiologist working with the Public Health Agency of Canada as a lead of the Dairy Antimicrobial Resistance and Use Surveillance Program. And I also work as a practicing veterinarian in dairy practice part-time here in southwestern Ontario, Canada, where I live. Um, and because that didn't keep me busy enough, I recently started a part-time PhD um, in epidemiology looking at antimicrobial use in dairy cattle. So I'm delighted to be here today to talk to you about the Canadian experience implementing integrated AMR and AMU surveillance in food and agriculture with a focus on dairy cattle. So for a quick breakdown of what will be covered in this presentation, I will do an overview of the Canadian Integrated Program for Antimicrobial Resistance Surveillance, or CPARS, the Canadian dairy industry, our dairy surveillance program at CPARS, and some results generated from the program. So first up is the overview of CPARS. So CPARS, or the Canadian Integrated Program for Antimicrobial Resistance Surveillance, is coordinated by the Public Health Agency of Canada in collaboration with other government departments, the provinces, and private industry partners. Since its inception in 2002, CPARS has expanded to cover three main components, so AMR and AMU in people, AMR in animals at various stages along the food chain, and AMU in animals and plants. The AMR components are in the top half of the figure and the antimicrobial use or sales data are in the bottom half. And the focus today will be on the farm dairy components. Um, so you can see them circled in the AMR and AMU sections. 
Um, but as you can tell from the complexity of this diagram, um, there is a lot of excellent work going on at CPARS beyond the dairy program. Um, so my colleague, Dr. Agnes Agunos, gave a presentation about CPARS, I think around a year ago to this group. So if you're interested in learning more about the program or other commodities, um, please look up her presentation or visit our website, which is linked at the bottom of the slide um, and also in the list of suggested resources that I prepared. So CPARS is also heavily integrated with another program within our division, which is called FoodNet Canada. FoodNet Canada conducts surveillance along the farm to fork continuum and integrates surveillance data from four components, including human cases of foodborne illness, which involves partnerships with provincial health units and laboratories, retail food sampling, including meat and produce, farm sampling, which involves looking at foodborne pathogens in the major livestock commodities across Canada, and environmental sampling of water sources like uh, surface water. The integration between FoodNet and CPARS underscores value for money by using the same platform, networks, isolates, and data to fulfill our program-specific objectives. So as you saw on the previous slides, there's a lot of opportunity for analysis and integration of information within CPARS. This includes the assessment and interpretation of trends in AMU and AMR, trends in AMR across bacterial species, across and within animal populations, and within human AMR. We also look at potential links between antimicrobial use and resistance, and for new or emerging resistance patterns. One thing to keep in mind when doing these integrations are the innate differences between the species or populations of comparison. To highlight this, one key concept is that we have a lot more animals than people living in Canada. So for example, looking at the unadjusted weight of antimicrobials sold for use in Canada, it appears that 80% were sold for use in production animals, with only 19% being sold for use in humans. However, if we adjust for biomass, that number is reduced to around 1.5 times more antimicrobials being sold for use in production animals than in humans. This is just one example of how context is incredibly important and should be considered before any comparisons are made. So this next part of the presentation is focused on the dairy industry in Canada and the surveillance program at CPARS, including development, implementation, and some results. So before we dive into the CPARS dairy program, I'm going to just give a quick overview of the Canadian dairy industry to bring some context to the surveillance program. I will say this is a very quick overview that misses out on a lot of details, so please do some extra research if you're interested in learning more. Um, so the Canadian dairy industry ranks third in the Canadian agricultural sector following red meats and greens and oil seeds. With cash farm receipts in 2023 showing um, $8.56 billion of revenue from the dairy industry, which is pretty significant. The dairy industry in Canada is represented by the industry group Dairy Farmers of Canada, who also help coordinate the provincial milk boards. The provincial milk boards regulate the production and marketing of milk. And although their responsibly, responsibilities vary from province to province, in general, the provincial organizations issue permits and allocate milk quotas to producers and set or negotiate milk prices in order to determine the revenue of dairy farmers. Something that's unique about the Canadian dairy industry is that it operates under supply management, meaning farmers purchase quota or kilograms of butterfat in our case, and must fill that quota every month to be paid. The quota is based on planned domestic production, administering prices, and dairy product import controls. So this means that farmers cannot legally produce milk in Canada without quota. So while dairy farms can be found in each province in Canada, the highest concentration are in the provinces of Ontario and Quebec. Um, as you can see in the chart, these provinces also produce the most amount of milk, which makes sense. And while there are differences by region, the average Canadian dairy farm has about 96 milking cows. And there are around 1.4 million head of dairy cattle, including lactating cows and heifers, spread, um, spread out over about 9,443 dairy farms across the country. Additionally, the Canadian dairy industry is known for its strict quality and safety standards for milk, also referred to as Canadian quality milk. So with all dairy products produced in Canada, sporting one of the two fancy blue labels you'll see on the screen. 
The main da- uh, contributions of the dairy industry to the food chain in Canada are obviously milk and dairy products, but also include lean ground beef and other beef products, pet food, byproducts like gelatin and veal. So now that we've done that quick overview of the dairy industry, let's move on to the dairy surveillance program at CPARS. So this program is called the Canadian Dairy Network for Antimicrobial Stewardship and Resistance, or CADNET ASR. CADNET started in 2019 as a pilot project that involved a collaboration between four veterinary colleges across Canada um, and CPARS. CADNET had multiple objectives, including establishing a framework to describe trends in herd level antimicrobial use and resistance in the Canadian dairy sector. Um, And since this was a collaboration with academia, there were also several research objectives included in the project. A lot of the published work that came out of those research objectives were shared in the suggested resources list if you're interested in learning more about the projects. Ultimately, our goal with this program was to increase farm level antimicrobial stewardship or responsible use of antimicrobials um, across Canada. I also wanted to note that this program was and is supported widely by the dairy industry and key stakeholders. The pilot program and the associated research would not have been possible without contributions from the Dairy Research Cluster 3 grant offered by Dairy Farmers of Canada. So as I mentioned, the pilot project kicked off in 2019 with the intention to enroll 30 herds in the five regions chosen for participation, including British Columbia, Alberta, Ontario, Quebec, and the Maritimes, namely Nova Scotia. The number of 30 herds per region was based on a sample size calculation, including both AMR and AMU outcomes. The herds participating in this program were enrolled based on specific inclusion criteria across the five regions. We also tried to enroll herds in the regions where FoodNet Canada Sentinel sites are located for comparison with other data where possible. So those sites are listed on the slide. So Fraser Valley in British Columbia, Calgary East in Alberta, London Middlesex in Ontario, and Matergy in Quebec. Uh, We don't currently have a site in the Maritimes, so those herds didn't have that um, extra consideration as part of their enrollment process. So we've had about 150 herds participating annually in this program. However, after the initial research and pilot phase ended in 2022, and the transition was made to a CPARS supported model, we were only able to secure stable funding for sampling in three core regions, which are British Columbia, Ontario, and Quebec. Um, with support for other regions gained through external funding where possible. So if you're interested in learning more details about the program, the methods paper is linked on the slide, and it's also in the list of suggested resources. Oops, there we go. So moving on to the implementation of this program, Uh, Regional field workers in each region completed sampling visits. So there were four visits in the first year and then only one visit annually in the years after that. They collected manure samples from three production stages or age groups, including pre-weaned calves, post-weaned heifers and lactating cows, along with a manure pit sample and and a milk sample from the bulk tank. So all of these samples were tested for E. coli, Salmonella, and Campylobacter, which are the bacteria of interest to our program looking at foodborne antimicrobial resistance. Additionally, a mastitis panel was applied to the bulk tank milk samples to investigate AMR from both the human and animal health angle, and all isolates that were grown had AMR testing done. So when looking at antimicrobial use data, our field workers administer a questionnaire annually designed to capture reasons for antimicrobial use, as well as herd demographic information. In the first year, our field workers did something called a garbage can audit. So a garbage can audit consists of placing receptacles in convenient locations on a farm where farm workers are then instructed to discard all drug containers into the receptacle over a defined period of time. The discarded containers are then counted to measure the disappearance rate of antimicrobials on the farm and to estimate quantitative antimicrobial use. For our project, the period of time was six months, and our field workers went out to count all of the antibiotic drugs present in the garbage can. Um, The photos in the slide were provided by one of our field workers in British Columbia, so we're very thankful to her for doing all of that work. 
Um, and since this is a fairly labor intensive process, very expensive as well, we've moved to collecting dispensing data from the veterinary clinics working with these herds to collect antimicrobial use data, which I'll elaborate on in the next slide. So just diving into the decision to implement veterinary dispensing data as a method for AMU data collection, in 2021, the CADNET group applied a questionnaire to the veterinary clinic servicing the 150 herds, it's around 45 vet clinics, um, to assess how feasible it would be to get the vet dis veterinary dispensing data to use for this AMU quantification. So dispensing data just refers to the amount of antimicrobial drugs that were sold to the producer or farmer from their veterinary clinic. So it really just measures the amount of antimicrobial drugs that are present on the farm. We do lose some of the granularity that we had with the garbage can audit, but it's still a very good measure of quantitative antimicrobial use. The questionnaire laid the groundwork for collection of this data, and we were able to collect most of the dispensing data from 2019 to 2022. One of the major challenges with dispensing data like this is that there's no standard software or inventory management program that's used in veterinary clinics across Canada. So this makes standardization and uh, aggregation of data especially challenging, but we're working towards automating this process for reporting in the years ahead. So one other piece of background information before we get into the results and the data um, is that in Canada, we group antimicrobials into categories of importance to human medicine um, using a system that was developed by Health Canada's Veterinary Drugs Directorate, which means this categorization system is tailored to our national situation or context. We applied this categorization system to our surveillance data because not all antimicrobials are created equal. Some are just simply more important than others for many different reasons. So these categories range from very highly important to human medicine. So things like third generation cephalosporins and fluoroquinolones, which are category one antimicrobials to low importance or antimicrobials that are essentially not used in human medicine, like category fours, which are ionophores. So getting into some data results, um, this figure shows the proportion of Salmonella, Campylobacter, and E. coli isolates resistant to three or more antimicrobial classes. As you can see, this multi-class resistance is relatively low. Um, one thing to note about the Salmonella data, though, is that due to the low number of isolates, the data has to be interpreted with caution. Um, some other notable results include that resistance to category one antimicrobials in E. coli was less than 5% in all years. There was no resistance to category one antimicrobials in salmonella from any year, and no salmonella isolates were resistant to greater than six antimicrobial classes. And ciprofloxacin resistance to Campylobacter, which ciprofloxacin is a category one antimicrobial, it decreased from 20% in 2019 to 15% in 2022. The graph seen here shows the proportion of isolates resistant to various antimicrobials among E. coli recovered from dairy cattle manure samples. And as you can see, again, the resistance is generally quite low. <laughs> Some points of interest include that E. coli isolated from calf manure samples had significantly higher levels of resistance to category two and three antimicrobials compared to other production phases. Tetracycline resistance was also the most prevalent over all years for E. coli. So this graph shows the proportion of isolates resistant to antimicrobials in salmonella. In 2020, a different panel was used for salmonella isolates, which excluded streptomycin, which is why there's a little break in the line that you can see there for streptomycin during 2020. Something to note is that salmonella recovery from the dairy cattle fecal samples was low across all years in the 3 to 5% range. And tetracycline was the most prevalent resistance in salmonella, similar to um, the E. coli figure. So as you can see, this is um, the resistant isolates um, present in Campylobacter. So resistance to nilodixic acid and ciprofloxacin, which are category one antimicrobials, um, ranged from 10 to 20% across all years. 
Further, Campylobacter isolates in 2022 showed no significant difference in AMR across production phase or sample type. And tetracycline resistance is again the highest. So the data presented here and in the next couple of slides are questionnaire data, um, which are collected by project field workers during sampling visits to participating dairy farms. Questions focused on reasons for antimicrobial use um, and to orient you to this specific table, the reported disease herd prevalence refers to how many herds reported having at least one case of this disease over a period of one year. The percentage of category one, two, and three refers to how many producers reported treating this disease with a drug belonging to each category. So as you can see, the reasons for antimicrobial use differed by production stage. And these reasons for use have remained consistent over the four years of reporting. Um, respiratory tract infections, diarrhea, and navel infections are the strongest, are strong reasons for use in calves. And fewer farms reported disease in heifers than in the other evaluated stages of production, which isn't super surprising. Overall antimicrobial projects reported, 20% were category one, 74% were category two, and 6% were category three. To take a bit of a closer look at the lactating cows over the years. Um, so for those who reported disease, you can see that clinical mastitis, dry cow therapy, lameness, and reproductive tract infections resulted in a high reported percentage of treatment, indicating that they're strong drivers of use in lactating cows. So in summary, category one antimicrobials were reported to be used by injection and intramammary routes of administration. Category two antimicrobials are most commonly used across all production phases and all routes of administration. There is evidence of selective antimicrobial use practices in both clinical mastitis and dry cow therapy, which bodes well for improved antimicrobial stewardship. The main reasons for use were calf respiratory disease at 13%, clinical mastitis at 17%, and then dry cow therapy and reproductive tract diseases at 10% each, which altogether accounts for uh, about 50% of overall reported antimicrobial use. And finally, uh, we make extensive annual reports, including antimicrobial resistance and use data for our veterinarians and producers participating in the program, where we share information like this that's specific to their farm and some national and benchmarking results as well. So um, what's shown on the screen here is just national salmonella serotyping results. Um, we share this data with both producers and veterinarians to hopefully return some value in exchange for their um, participation in the program, but also to act as uh, conversation starters on farm around antimicrobial use decision making. We also have an industry report and hold stakeholder webinars to report our findings to broaden the reach of our program outcomes. So this brings me to the end of my presentation. Um, just wanted to thank everyone for their attention this morning um, and invite you to email me anytime you have questions. Um, and I think we have lots of time for the question period as well. <laughs> thank you very much, Daniela. You can hear me? OK, yes. you can hear me? Oh, there you are. We have a question from Lucy, our colleague, Lucy. So yes, uh, please do feel free to thank you. Daniela, for the presentation and for the participants that meanwhile uh, joined. And uh, please feel free to ask the questions in the chat and I'll read them out and then we get the answers from, uh, from Daniela. So uh, the first one came from uh, Lucy. Thanks for a very inspiring talk, Daniela. Since CADNET ASR aims to support antimicrobial stewardship in veterinary medicine, why not including dairy cattle pathogens, example, mastitis pathogens, on top of public health pathogens like E. coli, Salmonella, or Campylobacter? Yeah, that's an excellent question. Um, so we are working towards, so we have started um, applying a mastitis panel to our bulk tank milk samples. Um, so we are trying to look at that um, to have more animal health um, outcomes because I totally agree with you. I think a lot of veterinarians see the reporting and think, okay, uh, they look at Campylobacter and E. coli and they think, 
all right, <laughs> um, what does this mean for my for my dairy cows? Um, but yeah, we are working towards getting the bulk tank milk data analyzed. Um, one thing that we're running into is that there's a very high number of unique pathogens that are involved. So we're trying to sort through kind of what's what's most important, I guess, and most um, has the most weight to report back to the producers and veterinarians, but that's very much a top of mind um, as well, because I think it will increase the value um, as well for the participating um, producers and herds. I hope I answered your question okay. Thank you, Daniela. While we, we wait for, for other questions to come in, oh, let me just admit the other two colleagues. Um, I, I have uh, two questions, not, not directly related, but something that you mentioned. One is broad. Um, and we can make it, the, we don't, uh, it's just my curiosity. You mentioned the quota issue. And I remember when I was a dairy uh, practitioner a few years ago. I want to think I'm still quite young. So I, it was, but at the beginning of my career as a dairy clinician in Portugal, and the, the quota was a big deal. Uh, the dairy producers having quota, not having quota, having to buy quota. I think now it's, it's changed a lot. And uh, now it's more a, daily, a direct contract between the, the producer and the, the, the company that buys the, their milk, and they make an agreement, etc. And it's always very, uh, it, get, it gets very easily political because it's a supply and demand. Well, there's places in the world that would, could use the milk that maybe kind of could produce more and take it there. So it's the, the, the demand is maybe just somewhere else, not in Canada. So it, it would be a matter of taking that milk to the places that they need it, et cetera. Is this quota issue something still controversial in Canada or is it uh, taken for granted and it managed very well? It's not something on the top of uh, an issue, issues list. Oh, that's such a good question. Um, I would say it's more the latter, um, that it's it's not so much of an issue. It's a bit taken for granted, you know, that they get a milk check every month. <laughs> yeah. That's very consistent. Um, yeah. So dairy producers are doing quite well in Canada, which is which is great. But um, I do think it started out that that way as being controversial. And I think it kind of goes in peaks and valleys where every once in a while people are like, oh, is quota even the right thing to do? So um, I would say... It's pretty minimally controversial at this point, though. <laughs> okay, that's always attitudes. Yeah, <laughs> that's always great news. The um, another thing that you mentioned was this uh, antimicrobial categorization, uh, the, and as you said, like we and we all know now, not all antimicrobials antibiotics are equally important, etc., etc., etc. How um, do you relate this? So, as if I got it right, Canada has its own as its own categorization which is, I guess, not equal to the WHO one or the other international OIE, et or the war, et cetera. Okay, I don't know if you're directly involved on this, if you want to speak uh, a bit about these issues of the categorization. It can be complex you know, to, to see, well, if there's already a global one, do countries need to do it? On the other one, on, and some others say, of course, countries need to do it because we need to adjust it to our own priorities. Or at least, can you, I don't know if you're involved, but how much... Uh, do you see this integration of the global categorization lists with the national ones? Oh, another good question. I'm not super involved in it. Um, yeah, that's that's more of our um, kind of sister agency, Health Canada. Um, but I I can see it kind of from two perspectives. Um, so one of them is that it's great to have the global lists and to be able to harmonize and compare where possible, where everyone's using the same categorization list. But I also think as a person who is working with the data that we get from our producers and looking at the list of antimicrobial products that we have available to us in Canada, it's not always super, um, I guess, relatable. I don't know if that's the right word. <laughs> um, but sometimes some of the products that are categorized in certain ways, we don't even have available. Um, so it's a little bit hard to kind of apply that to our specific context. Um, and I think for our producers, it's already a little bit of a higher, like it's a bit of a difficult thing for them to conceptualize. So making it as relatable to them as possible is, I think, a real um, bonus. And I think they like to know that we're looking at our industry specifically and what is kind of, or our industries, I guess, specifically and what's applicable to them. So it's definitely a hard balance to strike because I think 
they're both really important um, from two different perspectives. But yeah, that was kind of a non-answer answer. <laughs> That's fine. That's fine. No, and and like when we all, when we work on AMR, sometimes you are directly linked to a specific work stream. Like this categorization is something very specific, and you are uh, more and your presentation was great and focusing on surveillance. Then we do have a question from George Matteo, uh, our colleague from WHO, and on surveillance. So. Congratulating you, more than fair. Thank you for the excellent presentation, Daniela. Two questions regarding the use of surveillance data. Um, have you applied, maybe I'll read one and then the other one. Have you applied interventions in this sector based on the surveillance AMR MU data? So not in this sector, not yet. One thing that did happen um, right before our surveillance program started was that we had some legislation. So before, um, I think it was 2018 or 2019, um, producers could purchase antimicrobial drugs from like the feed mill, from the local livestock store. Um, but we had a change where they actually had to have a veterinary um, relationship <laughs> and a veterinary prescription to buy antimicrobials, which honestly is super long overdue, um, but it happened. So that's great. Um, so that's one thing that we've sort of had come into play, but since then, not really in Quebec. So in one of the provinces that were doing um, surveillance, they actually banned the use of category one antimicrobials. It wasn't a total ban. It was more of a, there had to be justification, like there were levels. So like, did they have culture and sensitivity? Is there a strong reason for use? Um, and so we did, we were able to kind of measure the effects of that change, but only in one region. So it's not really kind of across the country yet. Um, so I think there may be some um, interventions that are coming down the pipeline um, from industry. So it'll be really interesting to see that. I know in some of our other commodities, so in poultry and swine, they've implemented interventions and we've been able to track that over time. And it's really, really interesting um, to see that. So I I am very excited for the future of the surveillance program um, to hopefully see some, some impacts of interventions um, that could happen. But unfortunately, nothing really, I guess, substantial at this point. No, but it's it's uh, it's brilliant. And I think, well, it's always like the, the, the classical thing in epidemiology, if, uh, collect data to lead to something. You know? And I guess uh, you, you collect such good data in such a structure, well-structured way that it makes sense to... to but then follow up with interventions based on that today. Okay, so that was the first question from Jorge. And then the second, um, you showed small number of azithromycin resistance in Campylobacter isolates. If you compare these resistant islets with human origin, origin isolates uh, in terms of azithromycin, azithromycin resistance, so comparing the resistance of uh, Campylobacter in animals and humans, I guess. Yeah, that's a good question. I don't know if we've actually done that comparison directly yet. We typically do um, some comparisons between like our human data and our um, farm animal data, especially so um, we're quite lucky through FoodNet um, and through CPARS. We also get passive diagnostic data from some of our um, big animal laboratories. So we get all of the um, resistance panels that come through like the hospitals and the other clinics so we get some extra data to kind of boost our our numbers <laughs> a bit uh, like uh, ahead of our our surveillance programs so we typically do that um i don't know if we've really flagged azithromycin necessarily as a problem the ciprofloxacin resistance is something we're keeping a, a really close eye on because i think we've seen a bit of an increase in that in in past years um both in farm and human data and we always, um, we have a lot of internal analysis meetings where we look at something and think, hmm, that's concerning. Let's dig into that. And that's where those comparisons happen. I don't think we've done a direct comparison between dairy and human, but it would be really interesting to do. So maybe next year I'll present on that. <laughs> Excellent. I like what I hear. All right. We have a colleague from uh, Nigeria asking if uh, uh, the use of antibiotics as growth promoters is a practice in dairy farmers in uh, Canada? And if yes, what is its contribution to AMR? So the use of growth promotion in Canada. 
Yeah, that's a great question. Um, we don't really have a lot of, we don't really have any use for growth promotion um, technically in Canada. We do have some use of category four. So um, ionophores like menensin, um, that's used, it's not really used necessarily for growth promotion. It's used for a kind of like a wide host of reasons, um, namely disease prevention. So, uh, and it's category four, so it's it's pretty low level of use, and we see next to no resistance um, to those categories. We collect the data and we test for it, but we don't typically report it because it's extremely unexciting. <laughs> so um, the answer to that question is no, we don't directly have any use for growth promotion. Um, so it, I guess it's we don't really see any resistance because of it, but we do kind of keep an eye on it. Um, and especially like the ionophore uh, use. Excellent, well, it's, it's a very good question. And uh, thank you for your honest uh, and direct um, answer, Daniela. In terms of, if I got it, I know that generalizations are always very tricky and dangerous over, over generalizing, but it seemed to me that the resistance levels that you present were in general low, you know, the, from what you have seen. So that, yeah, usually in dairy cattle, I guess it's the kind of use, the fact that it's mostly intramammary. Usually we, we tend to find low resistance levels in uh, in the Riketa, which is, it's always, uh, I, I think we, somehow we we need a balance. Now we cannot be always terrific or uh, apocalyptic news on AMR. Sometimes it's good to see, well, you know, it seems that despite many other issues, we still see some low levels of resistance in, in the Riketa, for example. All right, so um, if there's, is there any other question that uh, colleagues would like to post on the chat? I don't see them, uh, Daniela. So thank you very much for your uh, presentation, Daniela, and for your um, answers. And above all, to do it the road tonight, you need to be very, and we, can, we could feel how passionate you are for your work. Otherwise, you would not be awake at 3 a.m. in Canada to make a presentation for us online. So excellent. Thank you very much. So if you could just stop sharing your screen, yeah, then course. I can stop share mine. Let's see if I can share. Okay, let's see if I do everything right. We do. Uh, let's see. We do have a, if I don't do it now, I can then put it on the, the later on the share. Um, on the the but you were the follow-up email. I just wanted to announce the next uh, uh, one. Uh, it will be on September 12th, and it will be AMR and the One Health approach from livestock sector in South Africa to integrate the surveillance in the Caribbean. So it's a colleague, uh, French colleague, a detector uh, from CIHAD that uh, will make that presentation. And uh, keep in mind that now we have these uh, two sessions um, in the month. And we start uh, this in this case for us in Central Europe, it was in the morning. And but the next one is in the afternoon session. So it will be three to four um, in September uh, 12th. So I guess that's it. Thank you very much for your attendance. Thank you very much for your presentation. And we'll see you on uh, September 12th. And uh, wish you a good rest of the day. And for you, maybe you can still take a nap before starting the, your day, Daniela. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>